Hello organic chemist. So in this video lesson, I'm going to introduce some of the fundamental topics around the issue of what are called stereoisomers. But before we get into talking specifically about stereoisomers, let's talk about isomers in general and how we classify molecules as having an isomeric relationship. So isomers, as you hopefully remember, they are two or more molecules that will have the same chemical formula, but there'll be some differences above and beyond, um, uh, you know, issues of structure, orientation, things like that. So we've got two molecules, same formula, but somehow they have different structural features. Now, broadly stated, there are two ways that isomers can be differentiated. There are what we call constitutional isomers, and then there are going to be the focus of what we're going to discuss in this unit, namely stereoisomers. Now, constitutional isomers, I suspect, are the ones that you're a little bit more familiar with. So they have the same molecular formula, but they're constituted differently. There's literally different connections between the atoms. So we have a different series of connections. Instead of carbon, carbon, oxygen, maybe it's carbon, oxygen, carbon. So you have the same string of atoms, but they are somehow tied together differently. They are literally constituted differently, okay? Now that contrasts with the idea of stereoisomers. Stereoisomers, they'll have the same formula, of course. They're also going to have the same connectivity, right? Carbon is attached to carbon is attached to oxygen in both cases. But what's going to differ is the way that the atoms are arranged in three-dimensional space. So sometimes stereoisomers, we might refer to them as 3D isomers, okay, three-dimensional isomers, because it's in their three-dimensional arrangement, the way the atoms are projected into space that is somehow different between two or more molecules to make them stereoisomers. And as we will see in a little bit, there are actually two subcategories of stereoisomers that we're going to get into. All right, let's take a look at some examples of types of stereoisomers. So here is a molecule, an alkene, that we have discussed in class before. And as we alluded to um, earlier in the class, alkene carbon-carbon double bonds, they cannot freely rotate. The carbon-carbon double bond is restricted from rotating. And that has to do, of course, due to the pi bond that exists above and below the plane of the uh, trigonal planar carbons of an alkene. So that pi bond inhibits rotation. So when you have an alkene arranged in one way, it cannot spin itself into the other way, the other flat version of itself. And because of that, we can have the possibility of having isomers if we have some asymmetry on both sides of the double bond. Let's take a look at this molecule, the pair of molecules I have down here, okay? What we have here is a molecule that would be referred to as 2-butene. Butene means four carbons, so we have one, two, three, four carbons in the main chain. The double bond appears on the second carbon. That's where the two of 2-butene came from. Now, we have different stereoisomers of 2-butene. Namely, we have what are called cis and trans isomers, okay? Cis meaning the same, trans meaning opposite. So we have the two stereoisomers here of 2-butene. Here I have the cis isomer of 2-butene. This would be the cis because the methyl groups are on the same side of the double bond. Think of the double bond as kind of being, I don't know, maybe a fence. And since the two methyl groups are on the same side, namely the top side, I guess, of this fence, we have the cis stereoisomer. Then we have the trans stereoisomer here, because in this case, the two methyl groups are on opposite sides of what we'll call the double bond fence, okay? So you'll notice all the connections are the same. A carbon is attached to a carbon, is doubly bonded to a carbon, is attached to a carbon. A carbon is attached to a carbon, which is doubly bonded to a carbon, which is attached to a carbon. So all the connections are the same. But the way this molecule is projected into three-dimensional space is different between these two stereoisomers, again, namely cis and trans. 
So let's get into these distinctions with a little bit more terminology. So now I'm going to expand the concept of stereoisomers out a little bit more. So we have isomers. They can be constitutional with different connectivity, not our focus in the present unit. Or they can be stereoisomers, same connections, but they are projected into three-dimensional space in different ways. Now, one way we can refer to these different projections in three-dimensional space is to refer to the isomers as being non-superimposable. You cannot lay one stereoisomer on top of another stereoisomer and have all the atoms um, overlap with each other. Maybe some of the atoms would overlap, but not all of the atoms. Okay. And so then with these different stereoisomers, there are actually two subcategories of stereoisomers. We have the category that are referred to as enantiomers. And so the relationship between these two molecules is that they are mirror images of each other. So you hold the molecule up to a mirror, and what do you see? That could be that molecule's enantiomer. Okay. Diastereomers are another subcategory of stereoisomers, and they are the category that fits into the issue of being non-superimposable. They have different three-dimensional arrangements, but the overlap between the two molecules, the similarities between the molecules, is not one of being mirror images. Okay? So the same connectivity, they're non-superimposable, but the two molecules don't begin by being mirror images of each other. And so the cis-trans isomers of 2-butene that we saw on the previous slide, which way would we catalog them? Would we catalog them as being enantiomers or diastereomers? Well, we're going to catalog them as being diastereomers. And that's because if I take a look at the molecule here on the left and I have it look in the mirror, it's not, it's not going to see this molecule on the right. Okay. So these two molecules are not initially related to each other by being mirror images. Okay. So these are non-mirror images, non-superimposable, same connectivity isomers. So they are stereoisomers, more specifically diastereomers. Okay. As we go through more examples of how we catalog different isomers with respect to each other, you'll see that the terminology starts to become a little bit easier to deal with. All right. Let's get into then uh, introducing the concept of the other kind of stereoisomer, the enantiomer. So as I've just alluded to, cis and trans are diastereomers. Same connections, different 3D arrangement, but cis and trans do not see each other in a mirror. They are not mirror images. Let's take a look at how we would create mirror images and hopefully begin to see how they're not superimposable. So the second type of stereoisomer are enantiomers. Now, enantiomers are made out of what we would call chiral molecules, okay? Chiral molecules. I'm going to come back to this term um, throughout the course of this video lesson and throughout our lessons on stereoisomers, but for now, know that enantiomers are also known as being chiral molecules. So these are non-superimposable mirror images. That's a bit of a mouthful, but let's unpack it. So here we have an alcohol molecule. Now you'll notice I've got a carbon in the middle, and that carbon is surrounded by four different groups. There's a hydrogen, an OH group, an ethyl group, a two-carbon chain group, so that's CH3, CH2, and a methyl group, a CH3 group. Let me just write in those formulas so that we're clear. So ethyl is a CH3, CH2 group, and a methyl is just a CH3 group, okay? And this is all off of that central carbon. Now, if this molecule in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide were to look in the mirror, it would see the molecule here that I have on the right-hand side, a central carbon, the OH is up, the hydrogen is now projecting down to the left, whereas before it was projecting down to the right. The methyl group is out front and kind of going towards the right, whereas before the methyl group was out and kind of going a little bit towards the left. And the ethyl is behind the plane of the board projecting to the right. Here the ethyl is behind the plane of the board projecting to the left. So I hope you can see that these two molecules are mirror images of each other. Here's a ball and stick cartoon of the same kinds of things, and this is doing a better job of showing you what this molecule sees when it looks into the mirror. 
Now, this is where you have to maybe get a little bit more comfortable working with molecules in three-dimensional space in your mind's eye and with models. Hopefully you would be able to see that the molecule on the left here could not superimpose with the molecule on the right. I could get the two central carbons to lie on top of each other, and maybe I could even align the OH with each other and the H with each other by moving the molecule around in space. But what I would then see is that this methyl would be sitting on top of that ethyl, and that this ethyl would be sitting on top of that methyl. So two of the groups would not end up aligning with each other in my attempt to superimpose them. So we have here non-superimposable mirror images that are stereoisomers of each other because they differ in the way the atoms are projected out into three-dimensional space. So these are enantiomers. So I hope you can begin to see a flavor of how enantiomers and diastereomers are both stereoisomers. They both have the same connections. They both have the issue of being different in three-dimensional space, but there's no relationship between the two of them in diastereomers, where in enantiomers, there is this mirror image relationship. Okay, let's keep going. Let's try to get a better feel for this idea of enantiomers. So here's a molecule on the left. I have a molecule here that we're going to call 2-chlorobutane. One, two, three, four carbons. There's a chlorine on the second carbon, so this is 2-chlorobutane. Now, if I were to draw the mirror image of this molecule using our, our, our stick diagrams, using our, our wedges and our dashes and our lines, um, what would I end up projecting if I wanted to draw the mirror image. You might want to pause the video for a brief second and try to draw it for yourself before I start to draw it. All right, so what will 2-chlorobutane see if it looks in the mirror? It's going to see a structure that looks like this. All right, so I have my carbon here. I have my carbon there. Now, what we did not overtly draw in, and I'll draw in now, is there is a hydrogen that's going back in the molecule. Right, This carbon has to have four bonds coming off of it. Two of them are shown drawn in the plane of the paper. One is coming out at us, so then the fourth bond must be going back. And so if I were to draw that structure, that bond, on my mirror image, it would look like that. So notice I again have two carbons, this one here, this one there, and they're surrounded, they're both surrounded, by four different groups. I've got a carbon here with a chlorine, a hydrogen, a methyl group, and then an ethyl group. I have a carbon with a chlorine, a hydrogen, a methyl group, and an ethyl group. This idea that we have carbons with four different groups is gonna be key as we will see in a few moments. So that's how we would draw the enantiomer, okay? We kind of keep the carbons in, in place there, and then I essentially flip-flopped the left and right-hand sides coming off of that central asymmetric carbon. I flip-flop the left and right-hand sides, okay? All right, let's look at some other examples here. And so what we're getting at is this idea that for a molecule to have an enantiomer, to have a mirror image that does not superimpose, it must contain a chiral center. So chiral molecules, molecules that can have enantiomers, have a chiral center. This chiral center is sometimes called a stereocenter, sometimes it's called a stereogenic center. Textbooks will use these terms interchangeably. Now the kind of stereocenter that we're gonna see most commonly in organic chemistry, the, the structural feature that helps us generate a chiral molecule and therefore enantiomers, will be a tetrahedral carbon with four unique groups. Now this is the most common kind of chiral center. It's not the only way that molecules can become chiral and have enantiomers, but it's probably the most common way. It is the most common way in organic chemistry to generate chiral molecules. So here's a chiral center. I've got a carbon with a chlorine, a methyl group, an ethyl group, and then the undrawn hydrogen going back. This too is also a stereocenter. I've got an OH group, the undrawn hydrogen going back, and then a two carbon chain to the left and a three carbon chain to the right. So while I have carbons and carbons on either side of this possibly stereogenic carbon, it's important that the 
um, that the chains be different eventually. They don't have to be different immediately. You know, carbon and carbon is not different immediately. But as you keep going out, you see that the left-hand side is different than the right-hand side. We could also have chiral center, stereogenic centers, within a ring. So here's a carbon with its bromine. The undrawn hydrogen would be going back. And as I go around the ring on the left-hand side, I see different structural features than if I go around the ring on the right-hand side, namely, of course, the double bond here. So this left-hand route is different than the right-hand route. So this carbon is a stereocenter. So let's go ahead and take a, a moment or two to draw some enantiomers. Let's take this molecule on the top left. Again, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to flip-flop right with left on the axes going to the left and right. So there's the enantiomer of that molecule. How about this molecule here? What I can do is same thing. I can put two, three carbons going that way. One, two, three. And then have my stereocenter. And then have the two carbons going out. Right? So I've just flip-flopped right and left again. And lastly, I could draw this structure here with my cyclic six-membered ring, put the double bond on the other side, and put my bromine there. Okay? So that would also be the mirror image. Okay? So just switching left and right. Now, here's another way I could draw enantiomers, and we'll get into this in greater detail in class, but I'm going to take this middle structure and if I were to keep left and right the same, I'm going to keep left and right the same here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the OH that was coming out at us. I'm going to turn it into an OH going behind the plane of the paper. All right. So in that sense, what I've done is I switched the two groups that are coming out and going away from us, namely the OH and, in this case, the undrawn hydrogen that's going towards the back. So if I just exchange any two branches coming off of the stereocenter, I will generate that chiral molecule's enantiomer. Okay? So uh, just different ways to draw the enantiomeric structures. Okay, so let's begin to wrap up here. And let's um, look at the issue of chiral centers. So the kind of chiral center we care about is any carbon with four different groups off of it. Okay, four different groups. Now, I should tell you that we don't always show the bonds, the wedges, and the dashes on a chiral center. And it could still be a chiral center. We'll talk about that issue in a greater detail. But for now, what we want to do is just be able to identify those carbons that have four different groups on them. So why don't you take a, a moment to see if you can circle all the carbons in these two structures that could serve as chiral centers. Maybe go ahead and pause the video now. All right, so let me show you where the chiral centers are. I have a chiral center here. I have a chiral center there. And then I have a chiral center here, and I have a chiral center there. So I have four chiral centers between these two molecules. This carbon right here is not a chiral center. You may have circled it because you may have been fooled by my use of the bold line there. But this methyl group is the same kind of a branch as that methyl group. Okay? So this carbon has two methyl groups coming off of it, which means it's not a chiral center. Okay? All right. So hopefully you're getting comfortable with the idea of stereoisomers the classification of stereoisomers into enantiomers, which are non-superimposable mirror images, and diastereomers, which differ also in their 3D arrangements, but are not related to each other by being mirror images. All right, we'll pick up some more details about stereoisomers in another lesson.